Hello everyone, and welcome back to Scary Interesting. In this video, we're going to go over three more terrifying cave stories. One of these features another brutally tight squeeze in an impossibly tight tunnel. The next was so bad that it resulted in a permanent closure of the cave. And the final story, if you can believe it, is still somehow worse than the first two. So as always, viewer discretion is advised. Today's video is sponsored by Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. If you've been following the channel long enough, you probably know I'm Canadian, and because of this, I took French in school for many, many years. Unfortunately, around a year ago, when Babbel first reached out to me, after being out of school for some time, I had forgotten much of my once decent French vocabulary. This was honestly a bit of a bummer because of how much time and effort it took to learn French in the first place. This is why I've been thrilled to work with Babbel over the past few months. Babbel's lessons are all designed by real language teachers. This means you go through a variety of different ways to learn the same concepts, like matching words with definitions, spelling words out, using the correct grammar, and even practicing your pronunciation with Babbel's speech recognition, just like this. Faire de la plongée. Faire de la plongée. So not only does it really speed up the learning process and enable you to have real-world conversations, but it's actually a fun way to learn, which obviously makes it that much easier to adhere to the lessons. And the best part about this is that when I'm away from my computer, I can do all the lessons from the Babbel app on my phone. Babbel even has different subscription options, like a lifetime subscription that's an insane value for what you get for it. So I'm curious to hear what languages all of you would want to learn, because right now, Babbel is offering 60% off a subscription for all Scare Interesting viewers. And this comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving it a try, with the link in the description below. Et maintenant, la vidéo d'aujourd'hui. That means, and now, today's video. On April 7th, 2008, 30-year-old Michal called his mother to tell her about his plans for the day. Michal was already an active and avid mountaineer, but had recently developed a growing interest in caves that began a month earlier. That day, he was heading to Oituf National Park, about 10 miles north of the city of Krakow in the south of Poland. Although it's the country's smallest national park, it's filled with hills made of limestone formed during the Jurassic period. Because of this, the area is known to the locals as the Jura and is some of the most beautiful land anywhere in Poland. There are also 220 known caves in the Jura, and Oituf is home to 10 of them. And although Michal had virtually no experience caving, he had spent the past month consuming as much information as he could about the activity. Reading and doing are of course two different things, but importantly, it didn't take much research to know something very important about Oituf National Park, which is that caving is strictly prohibited. Over the years, the caves were the target of robbers who removed fossils to sell, so to keep people out, barred grates were installed over each of the cave entrances. Unfortunately, even this didn't always deter potential trespassers, and it wasn't going to keep Michal away either. Although, honestly, he really should have taken them more seriously. As April 7th became April 8th, Michal's mother became worried sick. She hadn't heard from him, and he wasn't answering his phone, and he also promised he'd call when he got home from Oituf, but it just never came. She thought it was possible that it just slipped his mind and he was so exhausted from the day that he went to bed, but she wasn't going to take the chance. Instead, she hopped in the car and drove to Oituf herself to look for any side of him and came across his car quickly after arriving. There was still no indication as to where he went, but at least she narrowed down the possibilities. She then pulled out her cell phone at 12.45am on April 8th and called the police to report him missing. Authorities responded right away and arrived at Michal's car with a police dog, which picked up a scent right away but lost it just as fast. The police then reached out to a group that specializes in mountain and cave rescue called the Jura Group, which showed up with 22 rescuers and two more dogs. Then at about 4.30 that morning, these dogs led the Jura Group more than 65 feet or 20 meters above the valley floor to the entrance of the Sisposka Cave. At just 8 feet or 2.5 meters wide, the mouth of the cave is about the roomiest section in all its 230 feet or 70 meter length. The dogs then went into the cave with rescuers right behind them, then inside the opening was a chamber that slopes downward toward where a grate is located. When rescuers got there, they found a backpack, keys, and the grate off to the side. By then, there was little doubt that Michal was still inside, and if he was somehow stuck in the extremely tight tunnel, getting him out alive, if at all, would be extremely difficult. Even worse, the tunnel of this particular cave closes in on itself the deeper you go, which greatly limits how many rescuers can be inside at a time. In fact, only the slimmest of the Jura group members could squeeze through the tunnel as its walls got closer and closer. Even the smallest among them struggled, and one particular obstruction was extremely difficult for the group members to get by. One rescuer even compared it to trying to squeeze underneath a small car. 
After a few failed attempts at this, they realized they'd need specialized equipment to get through, and the fact that they couldn't get beyond the narrow opening was extremely concerning. Mihal was likely bigger than the smallest Jura group member, so if he somehow made it past that point, he was in real trouble. When the tools arrived, rescuers used chisels to widen the openings so they could pass through. Then, around 46 feet or 14 meters from the cave entrance, rescuers found Mihal's phone, watch, helmet, headlamp, and gloves. And next to those, they found his feet. It was far worse than they imagined. Mihal was wedged almost completely upside down in a section of the tunnel called the Clamp. The first rescuer got to him around 8.20 that morning, almost four hours after the dogs led them to the cave. He then called out to Mihal a few times and received no response. Then, pulling out a knife, the rescuer slightly pricked Mihal's foot to see if he would react, but he didn't move. It was only when the rescuer grabbed Mihal's ankle to take his vitals that the reality of the situation became clear. There was no pulse, his skin was cold, and his legs were stiff. He had been dead long before his mother noticed he hadn't returned. As his mother wept in the valley below the cave, the rescue turned to a body recovery. They were determined to get him free so his mother could give him a proper burial. Still using the chisels, the Jura group members inside the cave worked in shifts to remove enough rock from around Miel to get him out of the crevice. The work was painstaking and it took hours just to remove him from where he was trapped. After that, they had to figure out how to get him through the main tunnel because most of it was only wide enough for one rescuer to pull on him at a time. This went on for hours until they finally removed him from the cave around 6.30 that evening. When the body is held upside down for any length of time, gravity causes blood to pool in the head. To compensate, the heart has to pump harder and harder. Gravity also puts all the weight of your organs directly onto your lungs, making it so they can't inflate properly. Getting through an obstruction like the clamp means Mihal also had to make himself as small as possible. One technique for doing this is exhaling completely to empty the lungs before making an attempt to advance. Doing this can either get a caver through to the other side of it, or it might cause them to be stuck indefinitely, as was the case with Mihal. After his body was recovered, he was not autopsied, so his true cause of death is unknown, but it seems likely it was either due to hypothermia or positional asphyxia. On August 13, 1970, 35-year-old Hal Watts and 16-year-old Fred Schmidt arrived at Emerald Springs for what would likely be a quick dive. This sinkhole sits on private property and is surrounded by a tall fence with a locked gate, but the owners often granted access to scientists and other experts interested in studying it. Hal and Fred were neither, but Hal was still the only other person who was permitted to enter. This is because he was Orlando's most well-known scuba diver, and he used this access from the owners so he could train divers and instructors, specifically those from the cave diving community. That day, however, they weren't there for training. They already had a session the day before, but while they were in the spring, an important piece of equipment was lost somewhere below the surface. It may seem like a better plan to just chalk it up as a loss, but it was an expensive safety vest. In 1970, Hal had bought the vest for $142. Adjusting for inflation, that same vest would cost $1,500 today, so it was worth an extra dive to Hal to at least try to recover it. Now, even though the two divers were almost 20 years apart in age, both had a ton of experience. At the time, the Orlando area had only four divers certified to depths up to 350 feet or 107 meters, and incredibly, 16-year-old Fred was one of them. Hal, meanwhile, was a law school graduate who spent the start of his career as a private investigator in Atlanta before moving to Florida and opening up a dive shop. He then founded the Professional Scuba Association and dedicated his life to diving. However, cave diving certification was still almost a decade from inception in 1970. So while Hal and Fred had experience in sinkhole and cave environments, neither had the type of training that's available today. And if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you know it doesn't take too many mistakes before a cave dive can become deadly. In fact, just two years prior, Hal was exploring the Eagle's Nest sinkhole near Brooksville, Florida, with two other divers when one of them got lost in a silto. This happens when the fine sand along the walls and floor of the cave creates a cloud that can be so thick that visibility goes down to zero. So using up every bit of their air tanks, Hal and the other diver looked everywhere for their lost partner, but they couldn't find him and his body was never located. That day, however, Hal and Fred's descent to Emerald Springs was fairly unremarkable. They made it to about 150 feet or 46 meters deep in their search for the exp they made it to about 150 feet or 46 meters looking for the safety vest, but they were forced to leave after not finding it. Hal then signaled to Fred that it was time to ascend, and as they started toward the surface, they both got wrapped up in the guide rope they were using. Thankfully, due to their experience, they were calm as they addressed the situation, and they had plenty of air and time to cut themselves free. 
Hal then led the way as they started ascending again, and periodically he'd look down below to check on Fred. But then, not far from the surface, Hal turned his head downward and saw Fred's flashlight dropping into the darkness. Immediately, he turned around and went after him, but as Hal descended, it became more and more clear that catching up to Fred wasn't going to happen. At around the 300 foot or 91 meter mark, Fred's light disappeared into the depths. Then, even more horrifyingly, because of his rapid descent, Hal was faced with a new problem. He completely blacked out. Sometime later, Fred opened his eyes again and realized he was still hundreds of feet into a cave. Fortunately, the time he was unconscious seemed to be brief and he was able to get his wits together enough to continue toward the surface, but he still had no idea what happened to Fred. He was fine seconds before and never showed any signs of a problem, but he was now free falling to an unreachable bottom and with every foot he dropped, his chances of surviving plummeted with him. After Hal got out of the water and notified emergency services, the search for Fred began almost immediately, although from the beginning it was highly unlikely he'd ever be found. With the depth of Emerald Springs unknown and Fred wearing air tanks and a weight belt, there was little chance that his body would ever float to the surface. Additionally, the Emerald Springs sinkhole was shaped like an hourglass. It begins wide at the top and then narrows significantly before widening back out to a bell shape near the bottom. So even if Fred's body did float, there was a good chance it wouldn't make it through the narrow portion of the hourglass. But obviously still, they had to try to recover him. The first night of searching produced nothing as rescue divers Bill Thompson and Bud Sims descended to 375 feet or 114 meters, which was far deeper than Hal and Fred had gone and found nothing. The search was further complicated by the fact that descending so deep came with hours of decompression time, even if they only spent minutes searching. But either way, for four days, the dive team, which grew to six members, searched the sinkhole almost around the clock. On August 16th, the dive team, which included Hal, Bud, and Bill, entered the water for another attempt to find Fred's body. The three descended to only 300 feet, or about 91 meters this time, and just like every other day, there was no sign of Fred's body. As they started their ascent, they had a number of lengthy decompression stops ahead of them. This may seem like a much less dangerous process than descending, but when divers are stuck waiting at depths, sometimes for hours, it can be difficult to maintain attention on the dive. In fact, internet forums are filled with threads from divers sharing ways to pass the time during decompression stops, like singing, meditating, or even reading. During one of these long stops at the 150 foot or 76 meter mark, Hal's attention was drawn to a sudden burst of bubbles mixing with the cloud of silt to his side. Just like Fred a few days prior, Bud had gotten tangled in the ropes, but this threw him into an immediate panic as fight or flight kicked in. He thrashed in the water in a desperate attempt to free himself that only served to tie him up more and more. Now, approaching a panic diver can be dangerous, but Hal pulled out his knife and swam over to Bud anyway. He then grabbed the rope above Bud and sliced through it before swimming below him and cutting the rope that hung from Bud's fins. He was then completely free, but still panicked and thinking irrationally. So he started grabbing at the water above him, trying to claw his way to the surface, but obviously he was getting nowhere. Hal then took two deep breaths and blew into Bud's safety vest to help him float toward the surface. Then the two of them started ascending together, but after only a few feet, they were yanked to a stop by another tangle. Hal cut that rope free again, but then when he looked back at Bud, he noticed his regulator was no longer in his mouth. Instead, he was attempting to breathe through the tube connected to his safety vest, the same one that Hal had used to get some air into his vest to make him more buoyant. Hal immediately rushed to grab his spare regulator and tried to shove it into Bud's mouth, but Bud wouldn't take it because he was too disoriented and panicked to understand what Hal was trying to do. In a last ditch effort to save Bud, Hal activated their buoyancy control devices, filling their vests with air and rocketing them upward. It was an extremely dangerous move because they still had a lot of time they needed to decompress, but even still, decompression sickness was a lot better than drowning. Then, closer to the surface, the water suddenly went dark and cloudy, obscuring Hal's view of anything above them and they slammed into a ledge. Hal then felt something above him pulling on him and pulling his regular out of his mouth. Now he was tangled in the rub too. Throughout this entire ordeal though, somehow Hal had managed to maintain his composure. So no differently than he did for Bud, he cut himself free from the ropes and surfaced. Upon breaking the water's surface, he was sure he was going to see Bud on the dock being tended to, but he wasn't there. Before he could even think though, the agonizing pain of severe decompression sickness really took hold. It had started to set in while Hal was still ascending, but now fully surfaced, it was excruciating. Hal had been at a depth of 300 feet or 91 meters one minute and at the surface the next. He then shouted to the sport team and told them to get an ambulance as quickly as they could and arrange for a decompression chamber that he could be taken to. 
As soon as they understood, he slipped under the water again to descend a little bit to get some relief from the crippling joint and muscle pain he was experiencing. While Hal was descending again, the third man, Bill, who was still ascending, managed to run into Bud, who was still conscious and panicking in a freefall. Bill saw Bud come in toward him and tried to stop his descent, but in Bud's thrashing, he knocked Bill's mask off, and the delay this caused was devastating. In order to help Bud, Bill had to help himself first, and he rushed to get his mask back on and cleared of water. When Bill could finally open his eyes, Bud was gone, and by then, there was nothing anyone could do. When the ambulance arrived, word was sent to Hal, and he finally ascended. He was then rushed to Cape Canaveral, 60 miles away, and placed inside a hyperbaric chamber just before midnight. This chamber was then pressurized to mimic 160 feet and slowly reduced throughout the night. Finally, around 6 a.m., he was fully decompressed and on his way to the hospital, where he'd make a full recovery after a brief stay. In the span of just a few days, Hal had been involved in two tragic cave diving accidents as Bud died that day in Emerald Springs sinkhole. Both Fred and Bud's bodies have never been found, so a cause of death for each of them is unknown. It's believed, however, that Fred and Bud were both suffering from some degree of nitrogen narcosis. This may have caused Fred to black out and Bud to panic, ultimately leading to them both drowning. In the days and weeks that followed, the police would need to be called multiple times as people would show up on the property to see where everything happened. Some even jumped the fence and others even got into the water. The accidents that killed Fred and Bud were already more than enough for both the property owners and the sheriff's department to strictly prohibit anyone from ever entering Emerald Springs sinkhole again. Today, Hal is approaching 90 years old and is seen as a living legend of cave diving. On September 9th, 1990, Mark Healy, or Heels as everyone called him, arrived at a YMCA hostel in Melbourne. It was the kind of place he'd often visited as he traveled across Australia. Heels was a teacher, but as well as that, he had more than two decades as an outdoorsman, going on over a hundred expeditions across Tasmania and Western Australia. It didn't matter if it was skiing, caving, or walking through the bush, Heels loved the wild, and he tried and usually mastered every outdoor skill he could. He also loved teaching. He used to tell people that teaching was his life and that he loved his job. Now, spending time at YMCA's where they'd take kids out to teach them about the outdoors wasn't unusual, but that wasn't why he'd gone there this time. He told his family he was going on a skiing trip, lying to them because he had to escape what he was going through. Something had happened earlier that year and he couldn't shake the thought that it was his fault and that he should have done things differently. In July of that same year, Heels had been asked to lead an adventure camp at the school he taught at in Tasmania. It was promoted as an introduction to adventure pursuit activities, but the trip wasn't for the faint-hearted. The kids who went there could expect whitewater rafting, rappelling down cliffsides, crawling through dark, damp caves, and all the kinds of things an adventurous teenager loved. One of the highlights of the trip was going to be a stop at Mystery Creek Cave, located in the Southwest National Park. This park is just over 50 miles south of Hobart, and it has nearly 2,400 square miles of woodlands that rise above complex, interconnected cave systems. And both of these are millions, if not hundreds of millions of years old. Then at the edge of the park is Mystery Creek Cave, and it's a perfect cave to take inexperienced cavers into. This is because there's not much to worry about besides the creek itself, which is a shallow stream inside the cave mouth that's not usually more than a couple meters wide, if there's any water at all. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean it's perfectly safe. The beginner section of the cave runs about 400 meters to a spot known as the Matchbox Squeeze. Some more experienced cavers come in on the other side of there, rappelling down a vertical entrance and then walking through and out. But that would be too much for anyone with no experience, so most people just go in through the normal entrance, then as far up to matchbox squeeze as they're comfortable with, then they turn around and go back out again. Heels planned to take the group to the cave on Monday, July 2nd, and of the 19 students that had come on the trip, 8 wanted to go to the cave. He couldn't take that many out alone by himself, so he asked a teacher named Danielle and one of his more experienced teammates, Joanne, to come help supervise. The group of 11 then set off at just afternoon, hiking down an old abandoned train track and past a decommissioned limestone quarry. It was raining a little, but this didn't bother them. It was all part of the adventure. They were all wearing wetsuits, helmets, boots, and anything else they might need to stay safe anyway. When they got near the cave, the group ran into another man who'd just come out. He told them he didn't go far because the stream near the entrance was already deep enough to come up and over the tops of his boots, so trying another time might be a good idea. This man wasn't an experienced caver, but Heels was, and based on his experience, he was sure the kids could get through some sections of knee-high water. Later, in reflecting on the trip, Heels realized this was his second mistake. His first mistake had actually happened earlier. That weekend's rain had been heavy, and by Monday morning, around 4 inches or 10 centimeters of rain was believed to have fallen. 
Heels knew about this and knew to be cautious of heavy rain, but at the same time, when they reached the cave entrance, it really didn't look all that bad. The creek was wider than usual, but the water didn't go much higher than his shins. And importantly, the water wasn't as high as a small log at the entrance that cavers used to check if the water conditions were good enough to enter. In addition, the light rain they'd been walking seemed to be clearing up instead of getting worse. By then, it was 1pm, so he organized the kids, gave them another safety talk, and led them inside. And the cave was everything they hoped for. The giant stalactites hung from the ceiling, dripping minerals onto the floor and forming equally impressive stalagmites. Across the walls of some chambers were glowworms, giving a strange shimmering to everything inside. And every now and then, they came across a narrow stretch of water, and Heels decided to use them to teach the kids a technique he knew. Seven of the group would link arms and walk across the water, with Heels standing in the middle where it was deepest. Then, one by one, the other four not in the chain would cross, holding on to each person. Then, once those other four were across, the chain would pull itself across the water. The students thought this was fun, in addition to being effective for getting across safely. Then, at around 4.30, they reached the matchbox squeeze and slid down a passage known as the laundry chute back to where the stream flowed through the cave to the entrance. Around that point, Heels realized the background noise in the caves was louder than before, so he checked the water levels. It didn't seem much deeper, and the pressure wasn't high, so there wasn't much cause for concern. Heels then took the party up the stream until they reached a spot where the water met a sheer rock phase. They would then have to cross the stream to walk back on the opposite side. They formed a chain just like the other times, and Heels put himself in the center, and the strongest students were on either side of him to make the chain as solid as possible. The smallest students were then told to cross one at a time. At this point, they were only about 170 meters from the cave entrance, but this time wasn't like before. The water was only up to his knees where Heels was standing, but it had so much force that the kids crossing had to grab onto anything they could to stay upright. The first student to go stumbled on these slippery rocks, but Heels managed to catch him and help him across. Then the smallest member of the group made her way across too. She also struggled and stumbled almost as soon as she got in the water, but Heels encouraged her to keep going. So slowly, the student made her way across, but then just one step from the opposite side, her foot slipped again. This time, she was caught by the current and dragged under the water. She was then carried downstream several meters before getting pinned at a rock wall by the current. This was a section where the water flowed underneath a crack, meaning she was trapped like an object too big for a drain. All the others could see was the top of her helmet sticking out of the water. After seeing the student get swept away, her best friend almost immediately went after her and got to where she was stuck and tried to keep her head above the water. And she did manage to keep her friend's head above the water, but it was clear she was struggling too. One of the adults, Joanne, then went after the two girls, but almost as soon as she reached them, all three of them broke free from the wall and were swept away further into the tunnel. Heels, meanwhile, was helping the others onto the banks, and then as soon as they were clear, rushed into the water after the other three. Unfortunately, in his haste and in the strong current, he fell as he was running over and lost a boot in the process. Then, as he stood up again, he saw them get washed around a corner and out of sight. Either way, he continued after them until he reached a dry chamber where he knew the water would flow through. When he reached it though, there was no one. Then at some point, he thought he heard a cry for help from one of the cave passages and continued running frantically searching for them. He then returned to the others briefly and yelled at them to stay where they were and put the student teacher Danielle in charge. Afterward, he continued searching desperately through the passages for hours trying any and every chamber he knew of that he thought they could be. Meanwhile, the other kids stayed where they were, waiting for Heels to return and too scared to re-enter the water for fear of also being swept away. Back at the camp, it was approaching 7 p.m., and there was no sign of Heels and the rest of the group. By then, it was hours after they were supposed to return, even if they'd lost track of time. So the others then called the police, who contacted the rescue services and asked for skilled carers who knew the area and could get there from Hobart as soon as possible. Back inside the cave, the water was actually getting deeper and deeper, and Heels was still fighting his way through every stream and squeezing his way into every passage and chamber he could. During this, he was hysterical. And even though he was getting worried for his own safety due to hypothermia, he had to keep looking. The rescue cavers pulled into the parking lot near the cave at 10 p.m. and then went right to the cave entrance and inside. It wasn't until 10.55 p.m. that the students were finally seen for the first time. The cavers then set up ropes across the stream near the entrance and they used them to get the four students on the closest side across. They were then taken out of the cave and looked after. By then, the water was another meter higher and not even the experienced cavers were willing to wade through to get to the two remaining students and the teacher on the other side. The rescue team then asked for a ladder to be brought in, but even though they were close to the mouth of the cave, they still couldn't get it over the stream, which was more like a river until about 2.30 a.m. Finally, the water had receded a bit and the kids and student teacher climbed over one by one, but still at this point, Heels and the other three who were swept away still hadn't been located. 
It wasn't until 5 a.m. that the rescue team managed to find Heels. By then, water levels had finally dropped and Heels was broken. They found him sitting on a rock, his head in his knees with a couple of candles lit for warmth and light. He even started searching again when he found out that the others were still missing and it was another hour before they managed to persuade him to finally leave the cave. Then at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, they found Joanne and the two students. Tragically, they'd all passed away. In the end though, even more tragically, Mystery Creek had four victims, not three. After the accident, Heels was never the same again. His wife said that a different man walked out of Mystery Creek Cave. He was shattered, broken, and haunted by the events and desperately needed peace. Even more tragically, a later inquest put the blame on the unpredictable weather and exonerated Heels. It even commended his bravery and that of Joanne and the other student. But unfortunately, he would never know about that. That September, he hadn't gone to Melbourne to clear his head. Shortly after checking into the hostel, he fell from a 10th story window. Hello everyone, if you made it this far, thanks so much for tuning in. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description. And a huge thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check them out using the link in the description. And hopefully I will see you in the next one.